Hello everyone, welcome to another live hangout here at Voice Essentials, Monday the, what is it, Monday the 9th of August, and of course so many of you are still in your Sunday, I hope you've had a great weekend, I hope you are safe and healthy and in good voice wherever you are, if you are watching this show as a replay, uh, you are also, um, we're so happy that you, you, you jump on and watch this show as a replay, um, and we consider those of you who watch the show as a replay just a march, just as much a part of our community here at Voice Essentials as those of you who are already in the live chat and people are getting into it and uh, so good to see so many of the regulars. You are in for a real treat today and you know I have been so, I think today's show may be might just be the show of the year more for me than anyone else. I'm so excited to have my very, very good friend Sharon Tree coming onto the show and she's going to join us in a moment. Sharon and I, well, we'll tell you a bit more about our history uh, in just a moment. You are going to just fall in love with Sharon. She is just the most beautiful of human beings and to boot a brilliant singing teacher um, and she's going to join us in just a second before we do just a quick heads up for those of you who do regularly watch not only the live show but also my pre-record videos that as you know at least once a week generally about once a week and that's what i aim for i put up a pre-recorded often very scripted, very well researched, um, to the best of my ability, um, video that you know hones in on a particular topic. And of recent I've been wanting to really draw back the curtain on the, the goings on of a, a real singing lesson in a real <laughs> singing, uh, singing studio, teaching studio. And so uh, a number of my students I've been asking them if we can record parts, just just five to often five to six minutes of their lesson where they've asked a question and I've given an answer or we're workshopping a very specific area of their voice technically. And and so we've been capturing those and I've been, you know, just doing some very brief edits and putting them up. And it's a new series I'm calling the specialist sessions. And so what I'm really keen for you to do, um, if you would be so happy to do so, is watch these new videos, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> watch these new videos, if you could, and there's a new one coming out on Wednesday, midweek this week, and, and give me some feedback. Let me know, you know, are they meeting a need that you might or might not have in regards to the development of your voice? Um, and I'd love to get your feedback as the Voice Essentials community, um, I'm really hoping that it is highly beneficial, not just so that you, you get to see the lesson taking place, but the information that comes out in what is a very real, very authentic, raw, unscripted conversation that often takes place. So I'd love to get your feedback. And, uh, and we also love to get your feedback as a part of our live shows. Um, you can do that if you're watching right now, you can do that in the chat. Um, you do need to subscribe uh, uh, to, to, to join the live chat and there is a, a slight, um, like a, I think it's a five minute delay from subscription uh, when you subscribe to the channel to then being able to do a comment that sort of helps us, helps Linda, the wonderful Linda to moderate the live chat. Um, but we'd love for you to, to join in the live conversation as today's show goes along. And I guess we should get to it right now because I want you to spend as much time as you possibly can with the wonderful Sharon Tree coming right up. Sound check, check one, check two. I'm so excited to have you on the show, Sharon. <laughs> You're making me cry before Dan. Aww. It's lovely to be here. It's such a privilege. Such you, a privilege. You are such a special person in my life. And, you know, um, I, I've told you that before. And I'm telling the world 
Um, <laughs> you know, whenever, you know, we've known, how long have we known each other for? I think, um, I want to say 18 years. Oh, gee, wow. We, we will Look, both I actually have a prop. I have a prop here, Dan. Do you remember oh. this? <laughs> Do you remember selling me this? 2003. The singer's I bonk. I use it every day. You use I it still every use day. I that one every day. Wowzers. Um, 18 years ago, we were both a little bit younger than we are now. <laughs> yeah. If, am I right in remembering that that was a, a, a workshop, a, a vocal workshop at Gateway Baptist Church? Is that where we first both yeah, met? Yeah, that's, that's right. So I was on the worship team there. Yes. Yeah, so that was... Yeah, so you came in to run a workshop and I was at a bit of a crossroads in my life then trying to figure out what was next. And there you were doing the singing thing and talking about... <sighs> Uh, studying vocal pedagogy and I was like that's for me and uh, yeah it was really exciting yeah and and it has been for you because you know obviously at, from that juncture you have gone on to become just such a highly respected singing teacher um, not only in your local community but from for, for, for so many different people across the country um, you you obviously that original meeting was in Brisbane here in um, our hometown but where are you now let us all know where you are yeah so I live in Canberra which is the capital of Australia I think a lot of people think that Sydney is the capital if they don't live in Australia but um, it is all uh, down here in Canberra is where our federal parliament is uh, it's actually not the the largest uh, territory or state in Australia of course uh, there's about Oh, I think we're up to about 400 and something thousand people here. Um, and it's a lot colder than Brisbane and a lot drier. So the, vo the, the vocal kind of changes there um, have been really interesting. But then I didn't try to teach singing in Brisbane. I only started that when I really moved down here. Um, the, the year up, oh, two, two years after I met you, yeah. It's, yeah. A, it's a funny thing. A lot of people in Australia don't think all that highly of Canberra, but I actually really like Canberra. I, I don't know what it is about the place. I think it's partly because it's so close to the snow fields and our mutual very, very good friend, uh, Jenny, who we're hoping might be watching. I, I don't know if Jenny's watching, but uh, she, she probably is. Um, and uh, Jenny, hello, hello, Jenny. Um, she's hey, a Jenny. singing. She's a teacher in uh, Jindabyne. Do you reckon we should we should call her out and say, Jenny, you need to come. You need to accept an invite from me to come on the show in the future. Yes, <laughs> yes she does. <laughs> she does. Um, and so anyway, so Jenny's Jenny's a, a, another friend, and and we we're kind of the three Mouseketeers, aren't we? When we um, when we go to conferences, uh, we we just hang out together, and um, you know, in the world of, of singing teaching, um, it's so important to have people who you can trust and you can open up with, and you can be um, not only authentic with, but really quite vulnerable with, because it. The, the singing teaching world isn't always the kindest of places. <laughs> I'll put it like that. Um, and, uh, and so anyway, Sharon, you've always, and, and Jenny, uh, uh, you've always been those, those ladies in my life who, who I have just always gone to and trusted. And you've always given me good counsel. So, so thank you. 18 years ago was not only uh, obviously a, a pivotal time for you, it was a, an opportunity for me to meet someone who became very important in, in my um, development as a singing teacher also. So we probably should move on from the, you know, Mutual Admiration Society and step <laughs> into talking about some singing. Um, but I, I think it was important for us to start there because people might otherwise wonder why we're gushing over each other so yeah so <laughs> let's talk about today's topic and you know when when i when you finally said yes to coming onto the show because how i mean i asked you years ago years ago <laughs> i did um and uh and and finally you said yes 
Um, wh when we talked about you coming on, we talked about, well, what are we going to talk about? And, and uh, you sent me a few topics. And from, from the topics that you, talk, you sent me, I kind of came up with this, you know, voice is the axis of life. And, and kind of what I wanted to really open up in our discussion was sort of really seated in something that we often mention here on the channel a lot, and that is that um, the voice, the human voice, gives voice to the, the very personage of every individual. Um, and, and so I want to kind of, you know, maybe step off into that space, maybe if you wanted to share a bit about your story as your development in voice, and, and maybe we can lead off from there. What, what is, how did you get into singing yourself, Sharon? Yeah, I mean, I mean, I'd have to track it all the way back to primary school. Um, at a very young age, I was involved in choirs um, and concert band and, and playing the piano and uh, music was just the very center of my entire world. And when my parents divorced and my mother remarried and life was just, crazy unstable as a teenager music was everything and although I didn't start studying voice at that stage I was singing all the time I was in choirs I was in school musicals um, and singing was very important so I did a lot of exams on piano and flute and when I auditioned to go to the conservatorium to study music I actually auditioned primarily as a pianist I was kind of a bit tired of studying the flute um, and so when I was applying I asked if I could study voice as a second instrument. So I went in primarily uh, looking at um, classical voice. Very early on I wanted to change over to jazz voice and they wouldn't let me <laughs> and I regretted that to all, all the time but I did get to have um, a great relationship. Um, Adele Nisbet, who was mm. our lecturer in pedagogy at the con, she was actually my first year, you know, um, vocal teacher back in 1989. Um, and um, then she went on to her and I went on to some other teachers. Mm. But even then, voice, I, I learned the repertoire and of course I was doing classical so I had to learn in other languages and by the time you kind of master languages and memorizing and languages there was a bit of technique thrown in but I actually managed to graduate from the con without really consolidating my vocal technique mm. so then I'm out in the world um, with a music degree not earning any money from it doing a little bit of youth work in a church using music to pull a choir together there and a band together there and I was really at quite a, a bit of a loss about the direction of life, you know, the big, the big question. Um, so for quite a lot of years, I worked um, at uh, Griffith Uni in the education faculty, um, full time doing admin and secretarial stuff. And again, music was really on the back burner. I sang a bit at church. I did the odd wedding. Um, not that the weddings were odd, occasional <laughs> weddings. And um, Although I think we've all sung at at least one well, odd I've, wedding, right? I've, I've sung at my fair share of odd weddings. But anyway, do go on. I think the, I think the oddest one was one that was at 4 a.m. at dawn down at the jetty uh, um, in Manly, near wow. where I used to live. Um, and it was uh, the bride came in behind a piper in the, you know, the mist. In of the mist the, of the, of the... Um, the sailboats. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, odd weddings aside, um, music definitely kind of was, was my my medicine and my my heart but um it didn't you know feature prominently um and i was i was really on the hunt for what life was um, like what my vocation was about next yeah. when i met you and i i don't know if i would have stumbled into it if we hadn't had that conversation about what you had studied um and i actually can quite i can vividly remember standing in the foyer of that church talking to you about the, the study that you did mm. and I thought that sounds like something I want to do um, so it was great to go and do that and to finally have some singing lessons where I was making a lot more sense of it um, I did go and study with Vicky Rubin our friend Vicky um, in Brisbane before I um, did the audition and um, so it was quite incredible to go back in 2000 and late 2003 then and stand before Adele Nisbet again and audition for the pedagogy program 
Um, but I just fell in love so unreservedly with the larynx, with everything about the voice and the way our entire personage um, lives around this thing. Mm. Because I, I, I read recently the idea that, um, you know, the larynx is this extraordinary place between what we can control consciously and what we can't control. Yeah. You know, the stuff that is not within our control. And the voice is right on the threshold of that. Um, so as I studied that and started to unpack that, I just, I couldn't believe it. I remember sitting reading a textbook on a plane and you know, when you're reading these textbooks, Dan, um, you remember the um, McKinney diagnosis and correction of vocal faults. Oh, vocal faults. Um, and <laughs> I know, right? Maybe we should rename that, but great book. Great and book. I can remember sitting on the plane trying out all the things that he was describing and getting some like weird, getting some weird, weird looks, I would think. Yeah. The first time I ever read that nasal consonants come through your nose and I was sitting on the plane going hmm, and trying it all out. It was crazy. But um, yeah, and, and I guess I think I hope my story of finding your true vocation when you're in your thirties is actually an encouragement to people who come out of school, not really sure what they're doing. Like where, where is the path of life taking them and why do they have to have it figured out before they leave grade 12? Cause they're not really sure what they want to study at uni. Um, well, I didn't figure it out until way later. Um, so I'm madly playing catch up now. <laughs> and, and look for so many people, I think it, I think your story speaks to just how central, voice is to to everyone's existence firstly but but how how much more central it can become for 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 certainly people who are watching our show will really relate to you know the having this real sense of connection to that voice both you know um physically but also metaphysically uh and and really understanding and having that great sense that that this m embodies ev the expression of everything about their self yeah. um and uh and i think so many of us are on that not dissimilar journey you know i'm often asked how did you get to do what you do now and i, and I you know, like it's a really convoluted path yeah. to, to becoming, in our case, um, singing teachers. Um, so when it, when, so you've, you've, you, you opened your studio in, in Canberra and my observation of your, your development as a teacher over the years has been, you know, like not dissimilar to, to pretty much every singing teacher, but um, you've, You've found yourself working a lot with um, avocational singers, um, but really empowering them to work at a, you know, vocational level. And, and I know that you do teach professional singers. Tell us a bit about, you know, that process that you go through with singers when they step into your studio and they, they, you know, bring this you know, at times raw instrument to you and, and, and kind of place it in your hands. Isn't it a privilege? It's just, it, I know. And, and I have the great privilege of people walking in ready to trust me, which blows my mind um, that somebody would bring this thing that is so vitally their fingerprint their unique identity and say, let's work on it together. Um, I mean, I guess the process of starting to work with a person is to really, really ask them what's the heart of what they want to achieve with their voice. And sometimes I guess this is where I think voice is like an absolute revealer of the whole of us because what we think we want to work on isn't always what we really want to work on. I'm, it might seem like, oh, I want to try out for this audition or I want to have a better tone or I want to be, have more power in my voice or sing higher or sing lower. But um, underneath it, when you kind of strip down the layers, there is something more vital in there. Mm. 
And sometimes a person thinks I'm supposed to sound like so-and-so, or if I'm gonna, I work with a lot of musical theater uh, singers in the ACT in particular. Um, so there's a lot of, I'm supposed to sound like the soundtrack. I'm supposed to yeah. sound like um, Jonathan Groff when I sing You'll Be Back from Hamilton, or I'm supposed to um, sound like Beyonce if I'm doing her song. And it's almost like you can feel this palpable relief in the room when you help a person get through to the point where it's like, no, you need to sound like you. And they may not be sure what they sound like because they've been working with those original artists in their head for so long. Um, but to just allow a person to come into fully who they are vocally, yeah, usually that is a bit of a door that opens into them discovering who they are at a what? deeper level anyway. I think that, yeah, the voice is this doorway, right? Now it's it's so, and I, I kind of, I want to sort of preface my my next question with acknowledgement that there's no there's no one way to do this. But do you have any kind of process that you take a student along in that self discovery journey of their own voice? What are what are the, some of the perhaps even the questions that you might ask a singer who is you know, in search of that, them owning their own sound? Yeah, I mean, I think that some of the questions that are obvious and direct perhaps might be along the lines of um, who people are listening to a lot, who do they sing along with, who do they aspire to be like? Sometimes those questions bring things out. Sometimes there might be questions about background, childhood, stuff around how has music been in your life? What was it like in your home? Uh, what about your siblings? Were you the loudest in your family? Were you the quietest? Was there much music played in your home? So there might be a lot of background stuff there. I might also ask questions about a person's physical health and whether their singing has been interrupted by any life medical events. Um, but I, uh, those sorts of overt questions aside, I, I don't know if subversive is the right word, but I kind of, um, I kind of take a little bit of a different approach, and that is through doing stuff that's not necessarily specifically song related. I do a lot of stuff with movement and with um, toys, so mm. <laughs> like. Um, uh, perhaps like things that we put in people's hands or resistance bands or I've taken a lot of the work of um, some of the ideas that Pat Wilson has brought along to some of our conferences and and some of the professional development I've done with her and I have found that combined mm. with some stuff that I saw um, recently Chris Johnson doing mm. and honestly your squats Dan I use them all the time um, physicality yeah. helps people to, um, I think, stop being so focused on their sound. So one of the things I really want to do is bring a person right into their body yes. and into their kinesthetic awareness yes. of what's going on. So when they make a sound, what do they feel in their body? I use bubbling with straws, yeah. just like you. I use Swiss balls that people bounce on. Because, hey, who expects to, themselves to sound great if they're bouncing on a fit ball, right? Yeah, you kind of yeah. abandon your your preoccupation with how you sound and you're content to just bounce. But bouncing is playful. I was, I, th and that's, that, that's what I wanted to sort of just interrupt there or inject yeah. that, that thought of the wonderful thing about your use. And, I, you know, I've seen you, do, I've seen you do use the ball and, and I... I um, keep thinking, oh, I've got to get a ball. I've got to get a ball. Um, but the you the, need a place for it, though. Uh, yeah, but this, <laughs> that's the problem. Is I, you know, here I, I'm running out of space <laughs> to put all of these tools. But anyway, yeah. the the point being is I love the playful nature of it. It's a word I'm using more and more in my studio. Is is even feeling that I need to give the student permission to play you know why do you why do you think we we don't feel and it's particularly with adults because you and i work a lot with adults where do we where did we lose the ability to play sharon i think it's pre-puberty to be honest um and i have taught i, like I do still teach some children 
And I have the great joy of teaching one young lady who's in grade 12 now, but I started her in grade one. And um, to see her all the way through, I can pretty much pick the point when she started becoming self-conscious. And it's definitely actually pre-puberty, maybe about age eight or nine, I've seen my kids that I teach uh, suddenly become really aware that there's a right and a wrong and there's a good and a bad and whether it comes, like often it's something at school um, where yeah. there might be, I don't know, being picked for choir or not or just something where there's a right and a wrong and you've got to work really hard. And if you've got a personality type that's already a bit switched on to perfectionism, yeah. then there's just a real, it just tips over very quickly. Uh, that's certainly been my observation also. It, it's, it's almost there's an awakening of social consciousness. Um, and yeah. um, and it's in that in that mode of, of ch there's, a, there's a shift, isn't there? And we yeah. see it a lot in teenagers um, in particular. Um, you know, when, when, uh, uh, let's, let's talk more about, you know, on the other side of that and where you are now adults and how do you, you back to the ball, perhaps, you know, how do you play with students in the studio to, to, um, help them move beyond or, or through that self, you know, social consciousness? Um, I think by just um, allowing them to have experiences here in the studio and then hopefully experiences that they can repeat in their practice time um, where they are just experiencing release and freedom and playfulness, but just to suddenly tap into their voice in a vital and a, a free way. I, I love the look in people's eyes. They just honestly become so gobsmacked that that it can feel like that and they often often talk about it as a feeling not as a sound and i think that's really really important that it's not a sound they're trying to achieve it's a feeling that they're then trying to recreate and i don't know if this is right i'm not a neurologist but i reckon that if i can give people an experience here where um where their nervous system gets to actually get on board with this sensation and like, so say it is bouncing on the ball and they're just, everything's opening up and it's free and they're playful and they don't care, but they're making these great sounds. Surely that kicks off a pile of endorphins, right? Yeah. Neurotransmitters start bumping away and the nervous system, that subconscious part of us that works when we're not actually at work, the stuff that happens in our sleep yeah. and in between practice sessions, that starts to go, hang on, when this happened, she really liked that or he got really excited or he felt release mm. and relief mm. because it was so free and so open maybe we'll start looking for that and my hope is that by actually kind of having these moments of sheer joy in voice making even if it is only in an ex only in an exercise hmm. I shouldn't have said it quite like that. Even if it is in an exercise instead of in a song, hmm, um, Freudian slip, um, then maybe this is something we're going to hunt for. So the hopefully the subconscious then actually keeps looking for, hang on, that was tight. And then suddenly go, oh, I didn't notice I tightened up there. What's a freer way I so, can do so, this? So essentially, Sharon, you're telling us all that you're, you're in the business of creating singing addicts. <laughs> Yes, <laughs> that's a good way to put it. You, Can I market it that way? You, you that down. Well, yeah. Mm. Oh, you, we, we, you, <laughs> you've kind of dobbed me in because my my student Kelly um, Kelly, who's in the live chat currently. In fact, I'll, I'll bring it up so that we can so that we can see it. Kelly <laughs> Kelly said, I, I, "I'll have a ball handy for our lesson this week, Doctor Dan." Um, and Kelly has been. Kelly has put some really wonderful pictures up in the Voice Essentials Facebook group um, of her recent. She's in Canada and she's been, she's, I'm very jealous, she's been camping um, this last week. And some of the pictures are just amazing of the Canadian wilderness. Um, so thank you for putting those pictures up, Kelly. And yes, we might have to do some ball work. More importantly, we'll have to play a bit, won't we, Kelly, in our next lesson together um, coming later in the week. Um, so, so when you, when you, you know, made your student addicted to singing 
and <laughs> and you've got them playing and and working a little bit more you know what what do you find are the next steps that a lot of students in your studio want to take where do you where do you and i know that there will be a diversity to this answer but you know where do you find you 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 if we think about voice as the axis where do you find the spokes of that wheel headed yeah i mean in in the singing spoke um obviously the next steps are then being able to find that again at home outside of the mm. lesson mm. and for those who are performing or whether it's in a choir or on stage or gigging with the band being able to then take those experiences into their live singing um, which really obviously is the ultimate and I honestly you know I work with lots of musical theatre people who I am so impressed with have you know regular intense day jobs often using a lot of spoken voice and yet they show up and do a score that was written for professionals so the only difference really between professionals and amateurs is perhaps the amount of time they get to spend being playful right right the professionals get to actually be playful for their job yeah they get to go and do their classes and do all the stuff that helps them to be more integrated as a vocal athlete I love that book you recommended, by the way. I'm so glad you put that up those couple of years back. Yeah, the it's Vocal fantastic. Athlete by oh, such a Le, Le Bourne and Rosenberg. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. On the other spokes of life, I guess because we are working with people for whom it, you know singing isn't their day job. Yeah. It's about then where well how does that go into into everyday life? Yeah. How can you take that sense of authentic self and apply it in your job or in your family or in your friendships? Um, and in particular, you know, we might work with people who um, have to give presentations at work or are classroom teachers and are struggling with vocal health at the end of a long day of teaching, you know, kindergarten kids. Yeah. Um, so it's about, well, how can we actually bring that, that sense of how to, how to release the voice, how to yeah. unlock the voice and find the joy in it yeah. in those places. That, um, that ties you know in what? quite nicely. There's actually a question that, were, that got asked quite, quite early in the, in the chat and by Armando J. And, and they've said, I work at a call centre seven hours a day talking. Do you recommend that I do warm ups before I start my day so I won't affect my singing voice? Um, and they then go on to say thanks for your time. What are your, you know, in keeping with the very comments you're making at the moment in regards to so so few of us have the privilege and the fortune of of, of professionally singing full time um in the case of amando who's working at a call center yeah. seven hours a day what are, what are your recommendations they've asked about the warm-ups but beyond that also yeah i would absolutely say amando great question and yes 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 you should be warming your voice up before you go into work i think you'll probably notice a huge change in just that um as dan talks about the vocal dollar that your budget for the day will really increase and you'll be more aware and more in tune of how your voice is going as the day goes on um, i know that alongside um, school teaching and other professions working in a call center is really tough on the voice and added to it is the fact that you don't get good breaks and you might find it hard to maintain your fluids because you're worried about not getting um, yeah. you know a bathroom break or something so um, finding ways to warm your voice up before you go in and maybe even having something at your desk that helps you take care of your voice when you have little in between call breaks where there's some bubbling with straws into some water would just give you some relief that kind of thing but yeah. I think a warm-up would make a huge difference um, one of my clients would have a lot of difficulty, not in a call center, but in another um, health um, role, um, seeing patients back to back all day, we used to get a lot of fatigue and we put into place a quite a specific and achievable, achievable is really important, uh, vocal warm up for her to do um, on the way to work. Um, and she's noticed a huge change in how her voice is at the end of the day and therefore how her singing is. And I've noticed a big change since she implemented that about six months ago um, in her singing voice. She's actually, the tone is rounding out. She's getting a lot of strength. And we're not just doing um, kind of repair work in her lessons. We're actually getting ahead now. Yeah. Can I, can I affirm everything you've just said? And then I would add to that um, that you consider, Armando, the idea of, 
um, spending some time with a speech pathologist who may be able to do some functional work with you. This will only generally take two or three sessions with a speechy to, um, to really uh, as, uh, empower you, the, the function of your spoken activity and make it more efficient. Um, certainly ones like myself and, and Sharon, we work with your um, singing function and that, <clears throat> that does play back into your speaking, but a speechy is the one that is really directly, um, who specializes in voice, who is uh, fully um, equipped to really workshop um, your spoken function and you'll get a lot of efficiency and value in working with a, with a speechy also. But you know, in the meantime, everything that Sharon just said, go back, rewatch it, watch it a number of times because um, you know, everything Sharon just said is, is absolutely ideal. Um, Sharon, so <clears throat> we get, you, you know, you, you are working with these singers who are then, you know, spending, um, you know, call, seven, seven hours in a call center every day. That's, that's heavy going. Um, but, you know, even for those people who are not using their voice that much, they're then, you know, having to back up and, you know, get to the theater on Friday night and, yeah. and do a show. What are you working through with, with singers in the lead up to being able to do that and maybe have a season of four to six weeks of, you know, three to four shows uh, every week? What are, you, what are you working with people in that regard? Yeah, um, down here in Canberra, the amateur seasons often run for two to three weeks um, with uh, six or seven shows a week. So they'll have two rest days, often Monday, Tuesday, and then they'll be back in on Wednesday night. And they'll do Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, two shows Saturday, and sometimes also one or two shows on Sunday. Um, that's, so it's a huge that's a load. Big, that's a big load. Yeah. Yep. I mean, yep. that's a big load for a professional singer who, who doesn't have a day job you know, who right. is being employed full time. To... Wow. Yeah. Okay. That's, yeah. that's a big load. So, um, from weeks out, obviously they're rehearsing usually three times a week. Um, and that becomes part of the stamina building. Um, and so I do work with them on how they rehearse, how they warm up at rehearsal is really important because amateur casts, um, in Canberra at least, love to kind of out sing each other at warm ups. So I actually encourage my students to warm up before they go to rehearsal and then how to actually not over sing one another in warm up and actually even how to not do all the warm ups. So how to select which warm ups are right for them. So basically they warm up independently of what they would do in show, then be self selective in that process. And then how to pace things, how to um, sometimes to mark so that they don't f fully sing when they notice that the voice is fatiguing. So I guess education around how to recognize vocal fatigue, mm. um, how to build stamina, uh, stuff to do with eating, drinking enough water, um, cooling down post uh, rehearsal, um, steam mm. inhalation, um, bubbling with straws, um, getting enough sleep. It's so hard to, to get enough sleep um, and just being really mindful about um, how the voice is used in socializing. Um, so, um, even like if you're in the middle of a show, um, and you go to the foyer afterwards to, to chat with everybody, foyers can be very noisy and frequently they have materials in them that are just rebounding the sound and making it louder. So, um, the Lombardi effect, I think that's the right one, isn't it? Kicks in the, and because you can't hear yourself. Yeah, the Lombard effect. Lombard, right. Yeah. <laughs> I was thinking of Benui, it's the one with the eye on the end. Um, we, yeah, so you we just, could say Lombardi. You, <laughs> um, because I think it's not because we can't hear the other person. This happens in restaurants and clubs all the time. Yeah, yeah, it? yeah. It's not because I can't hear the other person that I raise my voice. It's because I can't hear myself yeah. that I raise my own voice. So monitoring that kind of stuff is really important because your voice is already tired from, you know, a three hour sing and then you're, talk, you're doing more talking afterwards. Um, and so I do encourage people to be aware of how to rest. And it's also um, being attentive to all those little disciplines. In fact, I've got the chat up on because Mackenzie has pulled me up on, you know, she said there at the bottom of the chat, Dr. Dan, practice what you preach and swallow, don't clear. You're absolutely right, Mackenzie. 
Um, and actually, what I've been doing every time I put, <laughs> every time today I've been putting Sharon up on screen, I've been drinking, trying to swallow water because, you know, my reflux today, everyone can hear from my clearing, Mackenzie, my reflux is really, really um, out of control today. It's because I, I did indulge on the weekend in spicy foods, I have to be honest. And so it's all these little disciplines that can lead to um, some inefficiencies, can't they, in, in your general voice? Sorry, I just wanted to, I wanted to respond to Mackenzie's accusation. Um, uh, <laughs> but she's right. We do, have to, we do have to be attentive to these things, don't we? Absolutely. And I think, um, you know, one of the questions we discussed earlier was, you know, how do, you, how do I help a person you know, from sort of when they first come in and I talked about vocal identity and understanding stuff around their their background. But I think a really, really big important one mm -hmm. is that we all need to know, and you're, it's what you're describing now, we need to know how we react to stuff. I, there's no point me just reading something online that says um, drinking dairy makes you um, have thick mucus. It mightn't for me. It doesn't for everybody. So we, uh, it's incumbent upon us to actually notice how our own voices and our own bodies respond to all of the things that we do in life yeah. whether it's exercise or sleep patterns or eating spicy food or drinking coffee we actually just need to work out for ourselves what's the right amount how does my how does my body respond and then how does my voice respond so i should pick a day where um, there are no vocal implications and drink some milk and then 10 minutes later have a sing and just see what happens we just need to know for ourselves and there's yeah. no point saying well i'll just have soy milk or almond milk instead because those can actually yep. have just as much of an effect so yes. we just that's that's a part of our vocal identity as well and that intersection of uh, that whole of life stuff also medications is probably another big one that i should should pop in there too yeah people being aware of how the medications that they take affect their voice that's a huge part of um how i help the theater performers balance the whole thing out it there, there there really isn't and again when we think about the title of today's video voice being the axis of of life there really isn't that much that we that happens to us no. in life where the voice isn't implicated in some way even even when you watch a movie and for example maybe it's a really sad movie and you find yourself crying through the movie that will have implications for your voice it might be nothing it might be minor implications but it literally well, i guess what i'm getting at is there there is virtually nothing that we do right. that doesn't implicate your voice in some way um and and that then speaks back to just how important our voice is and not simply for the for the you know the task that we're all interested here at voice essentials in regards to singing but in in every you know facet of our life um what do you you know do you find that there's a that that i guess this speaks back to the identity of a singer uh, you know um I want you just, if we can, and we'll have to, we might have to finish on this, just to speak to, you know, our sense of worth around whether we're using our voice for professional output or for avocational output. Can you, can you maybe just speak to your, you know, um, impressions of that and the way different singers deal with that, um, I guess, yeah. line in the sand? Yeah, I think that um, I'm a little, I'm, I'm just torn here because there's a part of my brain that's thinking about the idea about how our discovery of who we are as a singer becomes something that's really flexible. And I think sometimes, you know, in life, there's an idea of, well, this is what a singer should look like. So I've got to become that, but that can be quite a fixed, rigid thing. And part of this self-discovery around our voice is that we're actually a highly flexible, adjustable um, person who responds to all sorts of different things in life. 
And there might be a phase in life where what I think I want to do with my voice is audition for WAPA or go on The Voice or become the lead singer of a band. But in the process of actually discovering who we are as a vocal athlete and who we are as a musician, how do I want to play my voice? Okay, so if I learn the piano, the piano is always there, ready constructed for me to play. But as a singer, this instrument changes every day and I need to roll with that sometimes and I need to play the instrument that I have today. And maybe those goals I start out with aren't the ones I'll end up pursuing because as I get better at playing my instrument, maybe I discover that it's got colors and tones that I didn't know about because I was trying to fit it into that box. I was kind of not even aware that it had this whole scope. I love to use the analogy of colored pencils. So remember when you're like in grade one and you've got a colored pencil pack that's got 12 colors in it, one red, one yellow, a pale green and a dark green and blah, blah, blah. But what I say to singers, especially when they've got funny fixed idea, not funny, understood historical ideas about maybe chest voice or head voice. It's just one or the other. Mm. I love to be able to say, look, what I want to help you uncover with your voice is that, you know, those big whopper colored pencil boxes you can buy that have got like, you know, 132 pencils in it. And I've got three yellows and five greens and seven purples, purples the best. Um, <laughs> You know, why can't you have all of that? So that if the story of the song you're singing, um, you know, requires these sorts of tones, you get your paint palette out and you're going to paint that. Now, that might mean that today the colors I paint with are X, Y and Z because yeah. of the mood I'm in or yeah. the health of my voice. And maybe in five years or 10 years, as my voice ages and my body ages, there'll be different colors that I paint with. Well, I want to help people have a voice that is healthy, sustainable, but adaptable yes. and resilient. Yes. So that as those changes happen, you can always paint the story of the song that's on your heart today. I love it. It's it's all about empowering choice, isn't it? And yeah, yeah. And and I'm you know as I know you are you know one of the the best ways we can do that is to develop our technique, spend more time with our voice, get to know this. <clears throat> so there's my reflux again. And get to know, I swallowed Mackenzie, get to know, <clears throat> tr 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 trying to get rid of that reflux, get to know our instrument and then learn to work within the biological parameters that, that we've been gifted with. Sharon, I, you and I could keep chatting, but we're not, <laughs> we're not going to. Now that I've had you on once, you know you're going to have to come back again. Oh, um, I would love that. It would be, it would be great. And, uh, and everyone, just, um, just so you know, in fact, if I'm, let's see if I can be really tricky dicky. I'm going to just show you. So this is Sharon's website, everyone. So if you go to glengrovestudio.com.au and it is the most beautiful website. You can learn all about Sharon and what she's up to and you need to subscribe to, obviously everyone needs to subscribe to your Instagram. What is your Instagram handle? Uh, glengrove underscore studio. There we go. So everyone is, if and you're, and yeah, Instagram and Facebook pretty much double each other up. Yep. Same on both. And yep. you may, if you're a part of the Facebook Voice Essentials community group, you may even see Sharon's name in that group because Sharon actually is a moderator um, within, that, within that group. A, 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 a quiet moderator, but a moderator, a moderator. nonetheless. <laughs> um, and uh, a very trusted moderator, it has to be said. So, um, Sharon, thank you. Thanks for coming on. Uh, thank you. And, um, you know, I, 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 I was very much looking forward to spending, just spending the hour having a, having a wonderful chat with you. Is there anything you wanted to say in parting, in, in closing? Oh, um, look, you know what I was going to say, and it's not about voice particularly, but here beside my desk, I have a, a big, uh, corkboard full of pictures and Dan there is a photo of you and Jenny and I from the conference at Blue Mountains up the top there so I feel like you're always watching over me and inspiring Aww. my thoughts and um, what would Dan say is often something that 
it uh, comes through and I refer people to Voice Essentials constantly. Oh. And um, so I'm looking forward to when I finally start my podcast, having you on so we can talk all about your courses because they are so solid. And even though I've bought all three, I've only finished, I'm only halfway through the first one. <laughs> so I've got a little bit more to catch up on. You, but, you um, are always go. too kind to me, Sharon. That was a great conference in the Blue Mountains. That was one of Anat's, was good. one of Anat's better ones. And, um, and so, you know, and I... That was the last conference we got to hang out with together because, of course, pretty much, well, a couple of years after that, COVID happened. And so hopefully we'll get to you, me and Sharon, um, we'll get to hang out again at a conference soon yeah, because it's, be it's one thing to do it online, isn't it? It's another thing to be actually able to do it in person. Thank you for hanging out. Um, let, me, let me wrap up today's show. Well, there you go, everyone. So Thank you, Dan. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so good to have Sharon join. And I, I promise we, we, I'll try to get Jenny on so you can meet Jenny as well. These two girls are so important um, in my, you know, in what I do. And uh, I'm so pleased that you all got to meet Sharon. And you, I know you can hear um, in the conversation that we've had today um, just the heart she has not only for the process of teaching voice, but for the people she is teaching voice to. Um, and this is why she's got such an active, um, you know, dedicated studio. Uh, people love learning voice from Sharon, and, and I think you, after today, can see why. Um, look, I hope you've enjoyed today's uh, live hangout. Please hit the, um, the thumbs up button if you've enjoyed the hangout. Um, I love getting your feedback. Keep an eye out for the pre-record specialist session in the middle of this week. Of course, to be notified of that, you've got to subscribe to the channel and hit the white bell icon so that YouTube lets you know. Um, and uh, keen to get your feedback about this new format that I'm trying out here on the channel. It's all about authenticity. It's all about being real. I think that's so important. We don't see enough of it here online. Um, and I'm hoping that you'll join me as we continue the, join, the journey of a voice and, and learning more about it together. I hope you have a great week. We will be back next week for another live hangout. Um, Mondays, 1 p.m. Australian Eastern Standard Time. And next week, we're going to do a Q&A. So make sure you bring your questions and I'll do my best, best to bring some answers. I look forward to seeing you again soon. I'm Dr. Dan. Sing well.